Well, this morning uh, we begin a new book uh, in the Bible. Uh, after spending a few months uh, in studying the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and then we went into the Easter season, uh, I'm excited to just get back into a book from God's Word and go through it together as a church. So I hope that it's going to be thoroughly enjoying for you and um, enjoyable for you. We're going to be going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now, often 1 and 2 Thessalonians are celebrated as eschatological books. Uh, they are books that encourage the church regarding the things to come. Uh, and they are great end times books. Uh, but there is so much more richness. Uh, there is so much more uh, or so much more relevance to us as a church today. And so just to reduce them only to end-time books is to really miss out on what God is saying to His church. And so there's some good instruction, good encouragement, and I think this is going to be a great study for us as a church. Uh, Paul's words to this new church in Thessalonica have some tremendous encouragement. And uh, here we are 2,000 years re removed from that that church, and we're going to find ourselves in a situation pretty comparable to what they were going through. So before we get into the text, let's go through a quick overview of this book. Uh, this is likely the very first letter that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. Uh, the other book, which is a good candidate for that first place position, is the book of Galatians, but most scholars recognize it was probably this letter that was his first um, letter that he sent out. Uh, this was written about 50 AD. So this is about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, which means many of the people in this church may have seen or witnessed Christ. It's possible that some of them could have been one of the 500 that saw Jesus when he, uh, his resurrected body. Uh, so this is not that far removed that um, the idea of uh, Jesus was just this historical event. Many of these people would have lived it. This is the first of two letters that Paul is going to write to this very sweet church in the city of Thessalonica. So let me make a few comments about this city. Uh, first of all, it's one of the largest and most prominent cities in the Roman province. Uh, it resides on the coast of a gulf that branches out of the Aegean Sea. You can see it up there on the top right of that screen. Uh, and the Aegean Sea kind of comes out of the, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this, was, this city was founded about 315 BC. Uh, it was founded by one of Alexander the Great's uh, generals, uh, Cassander. And because uh, and you, you might recall from your history that the Roman Empire, or the Romans, conquered the Greeks. And so this is very much a Greek city. Uh, and it's comparable to a, one of its contemporary cities like Corinth or Ephesus. Um, so even though they are similar in significance and signif uh, similar in their prominence, as we're going to come to see in the study, they're very different, very different churches. Uh, so Thessalonica was a very cosmopolitan type of a city, and that's partly because it was a seaport city. A lot of international trade, a lot of economic opportunity, and as a result, a lot of people from around the, around the world were drawn to the city. So you have a lot of Romans, you have a lot of Greeks, you have Jews, people coming in from the province of Asia as well, and that's kind of the, uh, the demographic or the landscape of that city. Uh, it had a main street. Uh, I don't think it was called Main Street, but the, one of their main streets was the Roman Highway that went all the way across to the furthest eastern cities of the Roman province. So that should give you a sense of how um, essential this town is. Um, it's uh, with a population of uh, nearly over 300,000 people, Thessalonica still exists today. As you can see there, it's a very beautiful city. Uh, you can see that it's a, a seaport city. 
And uh, it's gone by a couple of different names, but right now, as a country, it's called Thessaloniki. Uh, and so that's what the, 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 the church that Paul is writing to is from this place. I mean, obviously, this is not what it looked like back then, but I wanted to put in your mind or at least get you to appreciate this isn't a random historical city that we don't even know if it existed. This is a literal city in Greece where there's a wonderful church. The Apostle Paul is sending them a letter. Uh, Theologian William Barclay, uh, he notes in one of his commentaries, he said that the arrival of the gospel to Thessalonica was essential to Christianity becoming a world religion. Uh, See, due to its um, location being a seaport, uh, due to the nature of a city and its international reach, uh, this was one of the most, this is one of the key ways that God was going to have the new covenant spread throughout the world. As a Greek city founded by um, one of the generals of Alexander the Great, and remember, Alexander the Great reportedly cried or wept because there was no more worlds to conquer in the world. So that's how far the the, the Grecian Empire reached. And so this little city was a very key way for the gospel to get to all corners of the earth. So Thessalonica is not an insignificant city. But who were the Thessalonican, who was this, this church? Who, who were the Thessalonians that Paul is writing to? What should we know about this body of believers? Well, it's worth taking a few moments to discuss or give a little overview of how this church came about. Uh, He is writing, Paul is writing to a church that he planted um, probably about a year prior to this letter um, on one of his early mission trips. And we can read that story, and we're not going to read it this morning, but I will give you a little overview. We read about this missions trip and the starting of this church in Acts chapter 17. And so uh, Paul would go to the synagogue, he would preach, he would share the message of Christ. Many Jews would get saved, many Gentiles would get saved. They come together as a body of believers and they, those, that little community of believers are the recipients of this letter that we're going to go through. Now, how Paul ended up in Thessalonica is a great testimony of how God orchestrates everything and plots the course for his people. So you might recall from Acts 16, Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go and preach to the province of Asia. The Holy Spirit stopped him. And then he was prevented from going north to Bithynia. And so with nowhere else to go, Paul makes his way to Troas. Troas is a city on the Aegean Sea. And while he's there, one night he has a dream. And in this dream, a Macedonian man appears to him in this dream and urges him to come to Macedonia and spread the gospel. So that's exactly what Paul did. And he made his way to Philippi. Philippi is in Macedonia. So after days of doing some pretty uh, wonderful ministry in Philippi, people are getting saved. He's delivering people from uh, from demons. Uh, This provokes the locals, the local Jewish folk, they, ended up, they end up giving him a, a good quality beating and putting him in prison. And of course, this is the famous story that many of you might be familiar of when Paul and Silas are in prison and they begin to sing and worship God. And there's an earthquake, it breaks the shackles, they get set free, right? Most of you have kind of heard that story before. The jailer gets converted. And uh, the outcome of that was... Um, the locals end up having to apologize to Paul and his friends, uh, but they did still ask him to leave. They didn't want him to stick around, so he left, and he made his way to Thessalonica. And it is there that he would spend the next few weeks preaching um, and spreading the gospel, and as a result, plant a church. Now, that's how Paul got 
to Thessalonica. Now, Paul and Silas um, had to leave town once again uh, because a, a mob or a riot broke out again. It seems to be a little bit of a pattern for uh, Paul and his ministry. It seems to provoke people. Uh, and so they leave town. They make their way to the town of Berea. And you may have seen that on the map. Uh, they head to Berea. It's about 50 miles away. Uh, and again, doing some wonderful ministry. And what do you think happens? The mob shows up. The mob from Thessalonica. They came on down 50 miles. Now, 50 miles not, might not sound like a lot, but in the first century, 50 miles is a big trek, right? And so that's how irritated the Jews were with the ministry of Paul, that they followed him. You know, they got on a, a long camel bus thing, and they make their way down and rebuke and disrupt his ministry down there. So you know you must be doing something good for the Lord if that's the enemy's game plan. But they were certainly bent out of shape with Paul's ministry. Uh, and once again, they were forced to leave. Now, in fact, he had to be smuggled out of town. That's how um, uh, volatile it got. Now, this, there's, a, there's, a couple of talk, there's a couple of really cool lessons just in that. It's not even the, the purpose of my message this morning, but I want to mention two little insights from that story that can be an encouragement for us. Although the, the Holy Spirit had prevented them from doing something that they wanted to do, it was for their good. And it was for the good of the gospel. In fact, if Paul had gone to province of Asia, if the Holy Spirit hadn't stopped him, he would have never done that other missions trip. He would have never ended up in Thessalonica. And remember how important Thessalonica is for the spreading of the gospel? That may have not happened if the Holy Spirit hadn't stopped him and redirected him according to his purpose. And that is a wonderful reminder of when God stops us doing certain things, or we don't get our way, or the plan, or this idea that we have, and God closes the door or stops it. What a great reminder to know, oh, something good must be happening if God is preventing me doing something I want to do. There is nothing wrong with Paul going to the province of Asia. That was a very noble cause. Nothing wrong with it, but God had a plan, and God does that. And so we should be encouraged sometimes when God doesn't allow us to do something that we think is best. All right, that's kind of a good encouraging point there. The second takeaway that, I, that stood out to me in that story was how enraged people get when they hear truth. I mean, the Jewish mob, they went to great lengths. I mean, you think these, this Jewish mob, that they, these men, you do realize they had other things they were meant to be doing Right, and they headed down to the next town just because they had been irritated and provoked so much by the truth, by the gospel. And that's a good reminder and encouragement for us that as a church, we should be reminded that the standard of Scripture, the gospel, righteousness, it has some collateral damage. Like it can really bother people. And it should because it is an irritant when you speak truth to someone who's not living truth, you're putting a pebble in their shoe, right? It's, a, it's annoying. And the more the gospel of truth demands that they abandon the things they want to do, you, next thing you know, you have a mob being formed. And so that's something we see going on here with Paul. And I'm reminded of Jesus' words in John 15 when he says, listen, if the world hates you, just remember, they hated me first, and that's so true. So that's, that's just a little quick overview of the city of Thessalonica and the church of Thessalonica. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, as you would presume. And I'm just going to read, we're only going to do the first three verses, and then we'll kind of hit, get, we'll get into it next week. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm just going to read three verses here. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your works of the faith, 
labour of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pause there. Verse 1 there says, Paul, uh, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians. Okay, so the, the letter starts in typical first century writing style where the author's names are put at the top, at the beginning. That's kind of odd for the way we write to one another. Uh, if you send me an email and at the top it does not have my name and it has your name, I think you've sent an email to a wrong person, right? That's just not the way we write, but that is how they did it back then. Uh, and as you can see, it's from three people. Paul, we all know who Paul is, right? Formerly Saul of Tarsus, and uh, he had that radical transformation. Apostle Paul, he's a rock star in the New Testament. Um, not musically, just figuratively. He's, yeah. Uh, Silvanus. Uh, now, Silvanus, that, that name it's, is like the Greek rendering of the name Silas. So this is Paul, Silas, and then, of course, someone we're all familiar, Timothy. Uh, this is Paul's dearest ministry partner. This is the young Timothy that receives the letters first and second Timothy. So that, those are the three guys here. We're pretty familiar with them. The first observation that I want to make and talk about here, because I think there's a good reason why we see this, and that is Paul's affection for the Thessalonians. They seem to have a really special place in his heart. And that becomes increasingly obvious the more we go through the letter. In fact, in, in chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, it says, he refers to the Thessalonians as his glory and his joy. I mean, even in what we read, I, I pray for you always. I'm thankful for all of you. In fact, in uh, verse 4, and we didn't read this, but we'll get to it next week, Paul speaks to the Thessalonians as being, quote, beloved by God. Now, that phrase, beloved by God, was a phrase that Jews applied only to supremely great figures in their faith, like Moses and Solomon. Only people of that stature, stature in their faith were called beloved. And here Paul is calling this local body of believers beloved. So as the Jewish readers, they would have read that and thought, oh, man, what an honorific title. You just called us beloved. So that should give us a sense on how special the Thessalonian church are to Paul. And you know what? Paul's ministry, he's had a rough ministry in many ways. Uh, he's gone through quite a ministry journey, having some ups and downs, some you know, hardship, some suffering, some toil. Right? In fact, we read about it in 2 Corinthians uh, 11. It, it tells us that he was imprisoned, he was beaten multiple, it says countless times. He was, he was whipped and lashed. He went hungry. He was shipwrecked. He, uh, he got stoned. And obviously, I have to clarify at this point that he was stoned with rocks, right? Some of the younger people are like, all right, all right. He's an open-minded guy. No, he was stoned many attempts at his life, sleepless nights. He's had a hard ministry. He has count the cost for spreading the gospel. None of us have had to do that. The worst thing we get is maybe a negative comment <clears throat> on our Facebook page or something. But he really has suffered. And then on top of that, even the efficacy of his ministry it probably leaves him feeling a little bit discouraged. He, as you know, he's the most prevalent um, church planter in all of the New Testament, and most of the churches, almost all of them that he planted, caused him grief. Now, I don't think that's his fault. I don't think that's because he did a bad job. I think that just speaks to the natural tendency the church has to, to drift and to stray without being tied down by Scripture. And this is the pattern of New Testament churches. This is the pattern of all churches throughout the church age. They have a tendency to cause grief and to drift or stray. Uh, for example, Church of Philippi, Galatia, Colossae, Ephesus, etc. These churches all had issues. Probably the most famous, Corinthian church, right? They got themselves a, a big letter 
from Paul addressing all the things they were getting wrong. They were getting wrong taking communion, they were doing idolatry, they were uh, suing each other, there was litigation among believer, the believers, they were abusing the gifts and so on, right? And that's why Paul had to write a letter. So that seems to be the standard for all these churches, not to mention the seven churches in Revelation. Jesus, through John, writes a rebuke to all but two of those churches. I think it was Smyrna and uh, Philadelphia were the churches that did not get rebuked. So we see that as a normative pattern of churches, they can cause some problems. And so for Paul, not only did he take a beating to plant these churches, then they caused him grief. But that wasn't the case with this church in Thessalonica. They were the one church that brought him tremendous joy and tremendous encouragement. Now, we all know that, uh, we've all heard the adage, right? Beauty is in the inside, right? Your parents probably told you that when you were going through your awkward teenage years. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah, beauty's in the inside, you know. Maybe I just heard that. Uh, but that is so true of churches. Um, that being an outwardly beautiful church, I don't know how beautiful that is. You know, if, if large numbers or high production uh, or slick presentations or big buildings, those are all meaningless if the health of the church is compromised, right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things, but they are superficial, they are external, and those things are only okay if the inside beauty of the church is of quality. It must not be, the inside beauty must not be disproportionate to the outside, unless, of course, it exceeds tremendously more than the outside or how a church appears. So the church of Thessalonica are an example, a good example of the church, a church that was beautiful on the inside, quality. They were an example of a church that had not lost their way. The church of, in Thessalonica was an exemplary church. Now, he, uh, uh, that's why writing to them brought him so much joy, because uh, they were the one church that were an exception to the rule. And worth noting, this church, as exemplary as they are, it's not like they lived in a Christian bubble. It's not like they lived, you know, there were churches on all the street corners, and society was just a culturally Christian uh, community, and therefore it's not difficult to be a Jesus-honoring church or to, to spiritually blossom. The, remember how I mentioned that uh, Thessalonica was a Greek city? You can rest assured that one of the most prominent attributes of that region was paganism. The Greeks and their pagans uh, paganism is a, a massive part of their culture. In fact, it, it was so a part of their culture that there were so many um, like sexual rituals that were surrounding it. So here we have this church that's flourishing, that it's the one church that Paul is like finding some reprieve and just encouraged by, and they're a community of believers that exist in a, the, in a, in a city of Greek origin that has a whole lot of mischievous and questionable activity going on, and they're flourishing. They were under pressure. And if we compare them to some of the other churches, like the Ephesians and Galatians and some of these other churches, that wasn't the case. Those other churches, although they were still God's churches and God was still doing something, I'm not writing them off, but... There was false teaching, and there was all sorts of idolatry and things going on. And here we have a church that had all the opportunity in the world to be subject to ideologies, uh, contaminants, and kind of be polluted as a church or lose their purity, and they didn't. What a remarkable church. So what made them exemplary? What's the, what's the secret? Um, is it... Uh, they had a really good church polity. Did they have a really good staff? 
Did they have, was the tithes and offering good? Did they have the right hymn books? Did the worship team, did they get it right? Were they doing things just like how everybody wanted? Well, no, that's not, that's not what made them exemplary. And keep in mind, as exemplary as they are, they're not perfect. They still needed discipleship. They still needed some redirection and things like that, but they were an exemplary, healthy church. In verse 3, Paul gives us some insight as to what those few things might be that makes all the difference. He says in verse 3, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Three cardinal virtues that should, no, that, sh- that must characterize the church, faith, love, and hope. Now, I'm going to talk about those three things in a moment, especially in the context that he's talking about it, but notice it said back in verse 1, uh, Paul addresses his letter to the church of the Thessalonians. So the word church, um, many of you probably know this now because I feel like I've said it numerous times. The word church is the Greek word ekklesia. Now, ekklesia is not a Christian term. Uh, it just means, it was used civilly, it just means a gathering of citizens called out of their homes in a public place to assemble. That's what ecclesia is. That's what the word church we use, right? And so in the Christian sense, when it says the, the church of Thessalonians, it's referring to the public meeting of those who have been called by God the Father and are in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's who we're talking about. And I mention that because as we review these three attributes that we're going to go through, as true and as applicable as it is for Heritage Church as a collective, these truths must be applied in the smallest increment as well, which is each and every one of us. So Paul's points that he's making here are inescapable for each of us. We all need to ponder this at a personal level and, yes, reflect on it also at a corporate level as well. Okay, so the first quality that Paul identifies as being a key reason for being a good version of the church is he says uh, their work of faith. He he praises them or encourages them for their work of faith in verse 3. Now, many of us well, many people flinch, right, when you hear work and faith together. You're like, oh, no, it's, we're saved by faith alone. Didn't Luther take care of that whole works thing for us, right? We kind of flinch at it. Yeah, I understand that. And we all understand that we are saved um, by faith, um, but works should outflow from that salvation. Uh, hopefully we know that. So we're not saved by works, we're saved unto works, right? And so, Paul, when he says, when he thanks them for their work of faith, he does not mean that they should keep working on their faith. That's not what he's saying. Rather, he's saying that the work, he's praising them for the work that flows out of their faith. Their faith is so substantial, it's so real, it's so meaningful to them that all their deeds, actions, and efforts come out of that faith. That's how real their faith is, that it controls a lot of their actions, and the good work and the good deeds are something that are just being outputted out of this church. This is a feature of the church. And it's the evidence. It's the evidence for true faith. Now, obviously, this can... Uh, refer to a variety of tasks, but basically anything that we are doing to try and bring honor and glory and attention to God is a good work. And Paul is blessed by the works of their faith. Secondly, Paul mentions the labor of love. The labor of love. So I wasn't sure at first how to... um, I don't know exactly what he meant by this. Did he mean that their labor, so all their effort, was prompted by love? Which, yeah, probably. And or was it saying 
that they were laboring in their love, meaning they're working hard, they're striving, they're committing to just being a loving person. So I don't, I don't know kind of what Paul means here. I could kind of go either way, and I think they're both true, and so I don't think we need to get bogged down by that much, but the word labor in this text, it, uh, the word means to exert oneself to exhaustion. So Paul is blessed humbled, so thankful to the Lord that he's got a body of believers that are strenuously outputting love out of their life. To believers and unbelievers alike, they are laboring in love for people. I don't need to go into a big kind of uh, teaching now on the importance of love. I think we all grasp how love is the, you know, love God first, love others, right? First and second commandments highest commandments, and we've talked about this recently going through 1 John, but this is an essential quality of a church that Paul's pointing at it specifically and saying, I'm so blessed by your labor of love. And it is labor, it is hard work, isn't it? Because many people are hard to love. It's kind of true, right? I mean, no one here, you guys are just wonderful people, it's effortless, but the point is, of course, there's going to be people in our life. Sometimes our loved ones are the ones that are hard to love, and we have to labor to love. Paul's making the point, oh, you don't just love lovely people, you labor in love because it is the height of Christian expression, right? And that means the world to Paul, and he's identifying it as a second characteristic or virtue of the church that he's praising or being thankful for. The third point here he touches on is he is thankful for their steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So apparently these Thessalonians, this little body of believers, have an endurance and they are steadfast because of their hope in Christ. There's something about what Christ means to them and what they're hoping for that keeps them on course, keeps them going. Now, in this context, because of the nature of First and Second Thessalonians, I think he's specifically referring to the hope of their, uh, Christ's return. I think that's probably what is meant in that verse. But it more broadly speaks speaks to the hope that we should have in God's promises, that God is going to be faithful to His church, faithful to us, and we just place our hope in that, and that we're steadfast with this. And as a result, because we're so hopeful about what Christ is going to do, um, we are unmoved, we are unfazed, we are unchanged. And that's what Paul's doing here, is he's so thankful that They have such constancy in their faith that they are unconquered by trials, by tribulations, and everything that arises from their environment. As all these pressures are going on around them and paganism and all these different uh, reasons or opportunities to compromise, and they don't because of their hope that Christ is coming back and they're, they're looking ahead, they ain't got time to look at all this, and they're so steadfast towards that that as a result, they just weather the rough seas of life. And Paul is humbled and blessed by that. So Paul is encouraged, and he rejoices that their faith has an outward uh, effect on their lives, that love, uh, they have a love that spins itself on service to others, and they have a hope that can't be taken from them. Paul has just laid out three things and said, that means everything to me. Remember, I have to remind you, this is the one church, or one of the few churches in the New Testament, that is a good version of a healthy God-honoring church. And Paul is just pointing to those three things as key qualities. Not that we're into formulas for things, but we can certainly probably take from this, maybe those three things should be esteemed, pursued, and valued in each of us and in this church. 
And maybe we would be a church of quality like this Thessalonian church. And it might be the key. I, I, I just wonder if, because I think most churches start out well. I think, they're, they're, I think all the seven churches in Revelation, I think they all probably started out well. Pure, innocent, focused, God first, doing great. Somewhere along the line, they began to kind of drift or stray or lose their focus or started thinking about this or worrying about that. And as a result, they ended up kind of over here somewhere and they lost their way. And people like Paul had to write them a letter. I, I wonder if these three things that's been drawn out here tethers us down, kind of locks us down a little bit. Maybe. So immediately after featuring these three um, virtues or these three characters, characteristics, um, Paul writes this in verse 4. You can have a look there in your, your Bible. It says, For we know, brothers loved by God, that He has chosen you. He has chosen you. Okay, so in the, it depends what translation you have, in the King James, it says the word election rather than chosen. So verse 4 says, God has elected you. So election, that's a buzzword in the church, isn't it? I can feel some of you tensing up right now. You were with me up until I said that, and now you're tensing up, like, oh, where's he going? Is he a heretic? Because <laughs> for some of you, for some people here, when we talk about the doctrine of election, it is the most precious, it's the, it's the high watermark of theology. It's, oh, yes, God's sovereignty. Yes, let's, uh, let's celebrate that and put a picture of John Calvin in the pastor's office, right? For other people, Election is a grand offense to the gospel. And people feel passionate either way. So what I suspect is going to happen next week is uh, we're going to have to discuss this challenge, this tension that exists between election and free will. And uh, I've managed to dodge that for a few years here, uh, but I feel cornered on this verse Oh, it's very important to people, and I know that there are people here that feel very strongly on different sides of this. I know that because it is the number one question I get when people call or come in to visit to find out about this church or to find out about me and the staff. It is the number one question. What are your views on election, Calvinism? And that just tells me that uh, it's a very meaningful verse, uh, uh, doctrine for people. So we'll talk about that next week, probably, unless I <laughs> lose courage. And <laughs> so one final thought that I want to share with you regarding what we've talked about this morning, and this, this point or this thought or this observation is like an overriding one that kind of just subsumes everything we've talked about today, and that is this. God is calling His church to be resolute. God is calling His church to be resolute. We must be immovable. We need to be uncompromising. You see, with the Thessalonians, no matter what the culture threw at them, they held the line. That's what made them special. Their worship team wasn't any better than the worship team from the church of Ephesus. That wasn't it. It's that they held the line and they were a resolute people. You know, one of the greatest tragedies, I believe, to, the, to American churches in general is that we've let the culture shape what we look like. Now, historically, the culture has been downstream from the church. We have shaped the culture. We have influenced we have held the culture accountable. We have shaped the contours and tones and hues of how the culture is experienced. Now, I'm concerned maybe now that the inverse is true. 
and I'm sure many of you feel that way. I don't know why the church felt like we needed to be more accommodating to the culture. There is nothing noble, there is nothing admirable, there is nothing acceptable about or or when the church is indistinguishable from the culture. See, when the church begins to morph from the outside pressure, when we feel the culture and society trying to demand different views and different ideologies from us, when we feel that pressure and we begin to morph, all we are doing is deforming. We're not being refined. This is not an admirable adjustment. And I think the culture, uh, sorry, the church, we need to be a resolute people. It's probably true to say um, that every church believes that they are a theologically sound church, healthy, and on the right track. I'm going to invite the worship team up just as I wrap up here. I think most churches probably believe that. Right now, there's thousands of church around America on a Sunday morning meeting, thinking to themselves, we are healthy, we are theologically accurate, and other churches are messing this up. There are probably people this morning thinking that Heritage Church have lost their way. I I understand that. Now, that's just the natural conclusion that you take from whatever perspective you're in. I get that. But there is a standard. There is a quality, a definable, measurable quality about a church that determines if they are truly theologically sound and healthy and on the right track. And it's not our self-evaluation. It's when we look, when we apply what we just read here over ourselves and over this church about having works that are good, that extend out of a genuine faith, when we labor in love, when we are steadfast and committed to God's promises, and those three things are our focal point, and those three things control us, and those three things are things that matter to us, and those are the three things that we're leaning into. If that is true, and we are holding to God's Word, we get to claim to be a healthy church. It's not based on a self-assessment. It's not based on account. It's not based on a bank balance. It's not based on anything else. What is, what meant something to Paul and what he was thankful for and what he prayed to God for and what brought him joy were those things. When we think about the, the churches in, um, in the book of Revelation, those the seven churches you had the, you know the church of Ephesus they had lost their first love the church of Pig- uh, the Pergamum they had false teachers Thyatira they had Jezebel teaching on idolatry church of Sardis they were absent of good works Laodicea they were lukewarm and so on right and I think Smyrna and Philadelphia were um, it, there was nothing negative said about them. And I've made some comments about some of the other churches we see in the New Testament. My point here is not to point the finger at other churches. It's not to compare ourselves to other churches. It's not to say, oh, we're better than the Corinthians. It's not that. The point here is to highlight that there is an expectation and there is a standard that God has of his people. And that when we gather together, that that would be a culmination of all those qualities and virtues. We want to be a God-honoring church, and we want to be God-honoring people. And the bottom line is, a church can lose their way. Maybe not lose their salvation. It doesn't mean that, oh, they're no longer a Christian church. Although some, it would seem, that they've departed so much from Scripture that you wonder sometimes. The point here is to just elevate and esteem what it means to be um, a a loving church that is working out their faith rightly. The Thessalonian church was an example of a flagship 
church. Uh, they were, or anything that was substantial and meaningful about being the church, that was the Thessalonians. Now, we are not a perfect church. Uh, we, we know that's true, right? Because look at us, right? A bunch of sinners here doing life together, doing church together. But that doesn't mean we can't be exemplary. It doesn't mean that we can't be a church that God is pleased with. And that's what we want to learn and draw from as we study through Thessalonians. And, and Paul has instilled a wonderful descriptor of how we're meant to be. And like I said earlier on in the message, this isn't up to me for this church to be that. That is up to you. As you leave today, as you go do your Christian life, it is on you to decide if your works are going to be motivated, compelled by your passion for your faith. It's up to you if you're going to labor in love and whether you're going to be steadfast in your hope for not only his return, but all that he says he's going to do in our lives and in this church. So Paul is blessed by a faith that is so compelling, it invokes work, by love that manifests itself in all manner of kindness to others, and a steadfast hope in our Lord, his return. These are three ingredients that are essential to being a healthy church, and they're also evidences that we are in Christ. And so as we enter into the study, just know that, that that's the foundation for this church. As, so as we read through all that they're going to go through, we've got to remember that it was built upon these qualities that Paul has identified. And I think for each of us, we get to make a decision as to whether we are going to be that type of a church that Paul is pleased with here. And that is going to be whether you're going to live that out in your life and honor your commitment to being an exemplary Christian that come together to be an exemplary church. Let's pray. Well, God, we are very thankful, first of all, that we get to be a church. We are a local ecclesia, a local gathering, the called out ones, because we're in Christ, we get together, we're a church family, and we get to figure out how to honor you, worship you, serve you in a way that is pleasing to you, minister to one another, be a light, be an example, be a flagship church, to be an example of something that is good and pleasing to you. And, and that would be a church that, that, that is fit for your use, as it says in Timothy, that we are vessels fit for the master's use. And that's what we want to be. And so we need you to lead us and guide us and convict us. And we, we want you to hold the reins of this church and to lead us so that you would be, that would be a, a church that brings joy to you, that we would bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, let's stand. Let's close in a song together.